I can tell you, right now, I don't see any way around hitting them. If we hit them, kill a lot of Russians, they'll move against Berlin. All right, they attack Berlin, that's NATO, and we're at war. Kevin Costner plays an advisor to the Kennedys in 13 Days, one of six new movies we'll be reviewing this week. I'm Richard Roper, columnist for the Chicago Sun-Times. And I'm Roger Ebert, film critic for the Chicago Sun-Times. For 13 days in November of 1962, the world stood on the brink of nuclear war as President John F. Kennedy told the Russians to get their missiles out of Cuba or else. 13 Days, a fast-moving, intelligent film by Roger Donaldson, views that crisis through the eyes of Kennedy aide Kenny O'Donnell, played by Kevin Costner, as a trusted advisor the president turns to as a sounding board. You realize when what you're letting can. yourself in? Kenny, no, we need the flights because the minute that first missile becomes operational, we have to go in there and destroy it. Fair them. enough. But Castro's on alert, and we're flying attack planes over their sights on the deck. That's Bruce Greenwood as Kennedy. The White House staff is terrified by the thought of nuclear holocaust, but some of the military, including Air Force General Curtis LeMay, seem almost eager for it. He is played by Kevin Conway. Now, General, what are the, uh, what are the Soviets going to do when we attack? Nothing. 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 Because the only alternative open to them is one they can't choose. For a time, it looks as if the nation may actually be going to war. Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara, played by Dylan Baker, suspects the military is trying to provoke hostilities. We were not attacking that ship. We were firing over it. That was not the president's intention when he gave that order. What if the Soviets don't see the distinction? What's clear is that Kennedy had to decide whether he could trust Khrushchev at the same time that he had to wonder if his top military command itching for a showdown was trying to outmaneuver him. By telling the story through the eyes of O'Donnell, 13 days creates surprising suspense even though we know how the crisis turned out. And Costner is very good here as a man trying to balance his duty to his country with his concern for his family. I think it's a superb film, but I'm going to make the argument to you that it would have been better without Kevin Costner in it because he's such a big star that the camera goes to him too many times. Or he's in the room with the Kennedys, and I know this is a real uh -huh. character, but I think his importance in the missile crisis and to the Kennedys is probably elevated here. I also think that Costner has a lot of trouble with the New England accent, that he kind of goes in and out of it, and sometimes he just does it too heavy. That was distracting to me, but I'm still recommending the movie because it's so well done well-paced, and as you said, obviously we know that we didn't go to nuclear war, but to see how we got to the brink of that, and the real bravery of the Kennedys was in not escalating and not going into military action, but again, I was distracted by Costner, by his very presence in this movie. But of course, they were ready to go to military action. That's what the movie makes frighteningly clear. Absolutely. That yeah. we almost had a nuclear war, and that, that would have been bad for everybody. And we also found yeah. out that a lot of these military people did not respect the Kennedys, even though John Kennedy himself was a war hero, that they didn't really believe these yeah. guys belonged in the White House. I'm going to defend Costner uh, because, you know, he is the star of the movie, and the movie is told yeah. through the point of view of his character. So if you do that, if you make that choice, then, of course, he's always going to be in the room because he's the guy who's there yeah. to record what's happening. And Kenny O'Donnell and other people did write their memoirs and were sources for some of this information. Yeah. So I, I thought it was fine. I and, found it to be a little... You know, I recognize some of the other people in the movie, too. I mean, Dylan Baker and so forth, because we've oh, seen I'm, them before. You know, real-life yeah. characters, but again, I think it was just more of a distraction than a help to the film. Okay. Okay, our next movie is Chocolat with Juliette Binoche starring as Vianne, an unmarried mother who causes a great stir when she arrives in a puritanical French town in 1959 and opens a seemingly magical chocolate shop. The sanctimonious Mayor Renaud, played by Alfred Molina, is outraged that this woman would dare to sell these decadent treats just as Lent is beginning. Let me try and put this into perspective for you. You'll be out of business by Easter. I promise you that. Vianne's landlady is a cantankerous free spirit who has been forbidden to see her own grandson. Vianne engineers a meeting. Would you like some cake? Oh. <clears throat> I'm not supposed to. Don't worry so much about not supposed to. That's Judy Dench in a great scene-crunching part as the feisty old gal. Johnny Depp also shows up as an Irish roustabout who sails into town bringing possible romance. Are you here to save us? Are you the Catholic Aid Society? French Family League, Communist Workers, which idea are you selling? Chocolate. This is the kind of movie where just about everyone is witty and fabulously attractive. The recipe for Chocolat is equal parts whimsy, romance, and slapstick comedy, with Binoche lighting up every scene with a smile sweeter than any confection. Chocolat has some serious things to say about the hypocrisy of intolerance and the joys of tasting life. 
But these messages are presented within the textured coating of a neatly gift-wrapped fairy tale. Yeah, I like it a lot. And Julia Binoche does have a smile and a face and kind of a sanity and intelligence in her eyes that just makes her one of the most pleasant movie actresses to watch. And I enjoyed mm -hmm. the entire movie. I have one observation. It's not a criticism. All right. It goes without saying that the Christians are the intolerant prudes who turn their nose up at everything. It's always yeah, the religious people know, who though. are the bad people. Well, yeah, but, but, but in this movie, many of them come to see the light. There's a young yeah, priest who's a nice the light, character. Yes. Well, usually and the priest... Uh, the priest actually uh, comes to see the light very quickly. Yeah, it's a sweet yeah. film, yeah. though. Truly, but it is, on every level. I just, I'm just pointing that out because when I was sitting there, I was thinking, you know, well, you'll never yeah. get it the other way around. I can live with that. Okay, but it's right. a, it is a lovely film, and it was very entertaining. Yes, absolutely. And Binoche, fabulous. Okay, coming up later, Nicolas Cage is a wealthy single on Wall Street who finds out what life is like as the family man. Oh. And coming up next, Kate Blanchett is enlisted to help solve a murder in The Gift. What's the matter? You see something bad? Your daddy. He took things away from you when you... when you were a little boy. Kate Blanchett plays Annie Wilson, a young widow in the rural south who has psychic powers that she uses to counsel people in our next movie called The Gift. And this is an unusual combination, a thriller with the nuances and sensitivity of a more serious drama. Annie's gift gets her into danger, when she befriends a battered wife and one of Annie's children is threatened by the woman's violent husband, played here by Keanu Reeves. You know, I feel sorry for you and your brothers. I mean, your mama being a witch and all. If she don't stop her evil ways, someday somebody's going to burn her up. And then your boy's going to be without a daddy or mama. Her son's principal, played by Greg Kinnear, is engaged to the town beauty, played by Katie Holmes. You think we'll live happily ever after? Fiance is murdered, and Annie's psychic visions lead her to the body and make her into a courtroom target at the murder trial. I can't use my gift for personal gain. Except for those, uh, what you call them, donations. You've had some personal trouble with Donnie Barksdale, haven't she, Ms. Wilson? The Gift was directed by Sam Raimi and written by Billy Bob Thornton and Tom Epperson. Raimi and Thornton also worked together on A Simple Plan, a great movie. And again, this time, they deepen and strengthen the thriller elements in their story by creating such believable characters. Blanchette is the key. She's a strong, quiet woman whose calm makes some of the scenes scarier than if she ran around being hysterical. Oscar winner Hilary Swank is convincing as the battered wife, and Giovanni Ribisi is creepy as another of the psychic's clients. The Gift is a surprisingly effective film. It really is, and you mentioned the cast, and obviously the cast is really good, but there have been other horror thrillers in recent months, something like What Lies Beneath. That had a great cast, too. Mm -hmm. The key is what you mentioned, Billy Bob Thornton's script and Sam Raimi's direction. Mm -hmm. There's not really that many surprises here, but it's just done so well, and the scenes that are played out, the, the, the quiet moments before the big shocks mm -hmm. that we know we're going to get and are still a little surprised about. That's what carries this for me and makes this film worth recommending. It's just a different level, as you say, a more literate take on yeah, a time-honored thriller that we've seen a million times as I, as I was watching the movie, I thought, for some reason, of the novels of Barbara Kingsolver, mm. who takes these women and puts them in a situation where their strength and their ability to hold things together is threatened by everything in their environment. And I know that this isn't the same kind of story, but the character of Clay, played by Kate Blanchett is handled with the same delicacy and the same detail, so mm. it becomes a real person and a real right. story, even right. though it's a thriller. And people like Katie Holmes and Hilary Swank and Keanu Reeves, smart actors who will take offbeat roles mm -hmm. in a movie like this. Mm -hmm. All right, coming up next, Nicolas Cage finds his life upended in The Family Man. I don't have time for this right now. I'm in the middle of a deal. Uh, well, you're working on a new deal now, baby. Kate Reynolds. Her assistant said you could reach her at home after eight. Kate Reynolds was my girlfriend in college. I almost married her.
Wall Street superstar Nicolas Cage is briefly reminded of the girl he left behind in The Family Man, a 21st century holiday romance with elements of It's a Wonderful Life and a Christmas Carol. Cage plays Jack Campbell, a financial stud and career bachelor who's plunged into a parallel world where he's given an all-too-realistic glimpse of what his life would have been had he married his college sweetheart, Kate, played by Taya Leone. At first, Jack is horrified by his cheesy New Jersey life, but he comes to treasure his children, his friends, and most of all, Kate. God, you're beautiful. Thanks, Jack. No, I'm, I'm, I'm serious. You're really stunning. This is good stuff. I want you to keep this up. I mean, you were always a very pretty girl in college. There's no question about that. Yes. Taya Leone is simply wonderful as Kate, who's down-to-earth and decent, but also smart and sexy and vibrant. Nick Cage is also effective, and I loved every moment of the relationship on screen. But while the domestic scenes feel authentic, remember, that's the fantasy portion of the movie, and the screenplay paints Jack and Kate into a corner from which they cannot escape. Jack and Kate didn't get married, and they didn't have children, and they didn't share all those moments together, and when reality finally intervenes, the resolution felt cold and disappointing. I'm giving a very reluctant thumbs down to the family man. You know, my thumb is slightly down, too, and that despite the fact that I love the work of Nicolas Cage and Tia Leone in this movie, and they're sweet together, mm -hmm. and they're warm together. And one problem I had was, all through the movie, I kept thinking of a movie that came out earlier this year called Me, Myself, I, yeah. starring Rachel Griffiths in exactly the same story. Chooses not to marry this guy she should have married. Yeah. Devotes herself to her work. Uh, magic happens, and suddenly she finds out what it would be like to be uh, mm -hmm. married to this guy and to have these children. Even down to the detail that the little kid knows it's not his real parent. Right. right down the line, and if you look at the two movies together, Me, Myself, I handles the same problems, including the one that you pointed out, much better. So as I think of the two movies, I can't recommend this one over that one, even though yeah. I think the, the work by the actors is really I like so top much top of this. Yeah. I probably like this better than any movie that I'm not recommending this mm -hmm. year, mm -hmm. but it just puts us in a situation at the end where we're really left high and dry. Maybe it should have started off with him as, as the family guy who finds out what his life could have been had he been a Wall Street banker. That It'll will be next better. year's movie. Okay. That's somebody right now, some writer, Go just the other heard way. you say that, and they're writing the first page of that screenplay. Our next movie is named The Claim, and it evokes the coldness and desperation of the northern California frontier, the Sierra Nevada, and its story of a man who built and ruled his own town but paid a terrible price for that power. Peter Mullen plays Mr. Dillon, the dictator of Kingdom Come, California. One day, two women ride into the town, and we sense at once they have a connection to Dillon. Nastasia Kinski is the mother, and Sarah Polly plays her daughter. Mr. Dillon. That's him on the horse? Dylan. Nobody else. It soon becomes clear to us, but not to her, that the young girl is Dylan's daughter. Not to give this to you. This is. It's for Mrs. Byrne. Hope. Hope. Your hope. Mr. Dillon has been living with a prostitute played by Mila Jovovich and now tries to send her on her way with payment of a bar of gold and the deeds to his land. I don't want your money. You tell me why. Deeds and tobacco has to them. Stop saying that! Why? Can't be. You think I don't know what's going on? It's that girl you want to f That little girl, you pig, you b- The story of how and why Mr. Dillon became separated from his wife and daughter is buried in old secrets and deep shame, and for his behavior then, he cannot forgive himself now. The claim was directed by Michael Winterbottom, who creates a cold, stark, forbidding world of newly arrived settlers trying to hang on in the middle of the winter. I was reminded a little of Robert Altman's McCabe and Mrs. Miller. 
The story is essentially a tragedy, the fall of a powerful man, but the movie makes it intensely human. I was reminded a lot of McCabe and Mrs. Miller, and that's one of my favorite movies, and this movie is nearly as good. That's how much I liked it. Winterbottom has a way of sort of dropping his camera right into the middle of these scenes. A yep. lot of Westerns have this sort of panoramic, kind of backlot feel, and in this movie, from the opening scene where everybody's sort of arriving in this town, the railroad guy and the long-lost ex-wife, you get the feeling that this is going to be a lot grittier, a lot more realistic than most Westerns. You can almost feel the yeah. cold on your fingertips. It's so well done. Yeah, so the, one well thing, done. the one thing this movie remembers is that in the middle of the winter, in a very cold mountain town where they just have a few log fires, there aren't a lot of panoramic vistas because everybody is huddled around the fire. They're and it all gives inside. you that claustrophobic and feeling. Have, yes. And then you find out that this man is so sad, mm -hmm. this Mr. Dillon. What he did yeah. and the price he has paid, he doesn't care about the village that he has built or the fact that he is the local ruler. And he's a pretty good ruler in his own way. He actually is. And there's a beautiful scene where he literally moves his house closer mm -hmm. to be with this woman. That's just one of those mm -hmm. cinematic images you'll never forget. Coming up next, Sandra Bullock goes undercover to stop a killer who is targeting beauty queens in Miss Congeniality. Don't mess with me. Our next movie is Miss Congeniality, an embarrassing comedy where Sandra Bullock goes undercover as a beauty pageant contestant so she can catch a serial killer. If that sounds like an awful premise to you, congratulations, your instincts are intact. Michael Caine slums it here as a Henry Higgins type assigned to transform Bullock's character, Special Agent Gracie Hart. Philip, could I have another Cabernet Sauvignon, please? Another cake for you? I'm good, thanks. It's okay, Philip. So, now how long have you been doing this pattern kind of training thing? I'm sorry? What, what was the question? I was distracted by the half-masticated cow rolling around in your wide-open strap. Gracie nearly blows her cover by tackling a man with a gun at the pageant preliminaries. Look, he had a gun. Of course he had a gun. This is Texas. Everybody has a gun. My florist has a gun. I don't have a gun. My ancestors were Quakers. Stan, please. Look, we're going to assume that any man with a weapon is a suspect. Not anymore. We got the DNA results. The envelope from the citizen was licked by a woman. DNA? There's never been any DNA before. Well, he slipped up. Or I should say she. This is preposterous. Candace Bergen and William Shatner seem to think they're in a campy send-up, or maybe they're just bad actors. There's also a poorly developed and completely uninvolving romance between Bullock and Benjamin Bratt. She's an emotional fourth grader, and he's an intellectual dwarf. Sandra Bullock is an appealing actress, but she has a penchant for selecting terrible scripts, and this is one of the worst. And I have to point out, she's also about a decade too old for this part, although 20-ish actresses everywhere should be grateful they weren't saddled with the clunker that is Miss Congeniality. Now, I thought she looked convincing as a beauty contestant, and I think she In was a lot... In the 35 and above division? Oh, oh come on now. You're on. not being very gallant. Now, she was a lot more... Uh, convincing, for example, than many driver in Beautiful. Oh, wow. There's a comparison yeah. for you. Oh, and, uh, really bad you know, movie. She, is, she is an engaging actress, and yeah. I enjoyed her in this movie, and yet I didn't like the film. Yeah. I'm sorry, but it does, the parts don't come together. The characters aren't convincing. Benjamin Bratt doesn't really fit in anywhere. No. Michael Caine is always fun, sure. but he's on his own planet, and it just didn't <laughs> click all over at the same time. I, it wasn't, you know, in Beautiful, I was suffering. In this movie, I wasn't suffering. It was silly, and I kind of yeah. liked it on that level, even though I'm not going to go thumbs up on it. I don't think it's as bad as you said it was. You don't have to apologize. The people who made this movie should be saying, I'm sorry. Okay, okay well, we'll wait for that to happen. That will probably take a while. We'll be <laughs> back in a moment. Join Roger Ebert and Richard Roper on their film festival at sea with movie screenings and lively discussions aboard the Disney Wonder Cruise Ship. Sailing February 1st through 4th on the Disney Cruise Line to the Bahamas with a stop at the Island Paradise Castaway Key. The Ebert and Roper Film Festival at Sea. Call your travel agent or 1-800-945-3806. Now let's take another look at the movies we reviewed on this week's show. Two thumbs up for 13 days with Kevin Costner in the middle of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Two more thumbs up for Chocolat and Julia Binoche's enchanting performance. Two more thumbs up for The Gift and Kate Blanchett's three-dimensional character. Two thumbs down, though, for The Family Man, but two thumbs up for The Claim and its tragic Western hero. And finally, two thumbs down for Miss Congeniality, although I like Sandra Bullock more than Richard did. So, some good movies this week, including The Claim, The Gift, 
13 Days, and Chocolat. I think out of those very good movies, the claim is by far the best. It's got a real atmosphere Terrific to it, doesn't movie. it? Yeah. All these movies open over the holidays, although some of them don't open nationally until January. Now, remember, you can learn more about our film festival at sea at our website, ebert-roper-movies.com, where you can also hear our reviews. Next week, we look back at this year and present our top ten list in a special show, The Best Films of 2000. That's next week, and until then, balcony is closed. <laughs>